Thanks so much for attending tonight's event, and I hope you will consider becoming part of the 117 Society. In doing so, you'll help AMSI and the K25 History Center continue our important programming, including AMSICast, our podcast begun in early 2021. Featuring scientists, engineers, science writers, historians, journalists, and others, AMSICast gives us the opportunity to engage and educate audiences around the world on a wonderfully diverse set of topics, everything from black holes to drunken botany, from Calutron girls to volcanoes. In the following clips, you'll hear just a few examples from some of our great AMSICast interviews. I hope you enjoy them, and please tell everyone you know about AMSICast and the many other resources we offer. Thanks very much for your support of the AMSI Foundation. Our first clip tonight features Richard Rhodes, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of books such as The Making of the Atomic Bomb, Dark Sun, and Heidi's Folly. In this clip, Richard comments on the amazing nature of our home, Oak Ridge, and its audacious contribution to the Manhattan Project. You know, I was really fascinated with Oak Ridge. Hanford, after all, is the big power reactors, nuclear reactors. That's a fairly familiar technology today. But to look at the sheer scale and complexity and bravura of the um, isotope separation systems at Oak Ridge, uh, with its heroic stories, like General Groves deciding to make the bus bars in the calutrons out of pure coin silver that he (laughs) got from Fort Knox. (laughs) <laughs> and then being able to gather it all up at the end of the war and ship it back to Fort Knox with very little loss. Those are stories that are right out of the, the twilight of the gods. <laughs> 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 really, to, to build that huge building that was basically mm-hmm. a mile around right. so that the the supervisors inside were, were traveling around on bicycles up, um, uh, uh, system that was almost entirely automated well ahead of its time. The whole challenge of trying to to find a system for separating U-235 from U-238 with only the slight difference in mass as the factor for separation, it, it was all just a truly heroic story and great fun to work on and write about and interview some of the old timers about. I visited, of course, Oak Ridge several times, Mm -hmm. walked the ground, and the buildings were still up then. So although you couldn't go in them, it was possible to get a sense of the the sheer scale of the whole thing. Oak Ridge was just a delight and a wonder, and and still is, let's, let's say so. John Tresh is a professor and Mellon Chair in the History of Art, Science, and Folk Practice at the Wartburg Institute. He spoke with us on AMSICast about his terrific book, The Reason for the Darkness of the Night, Edgar Allan Poe and the Forging of American Science. Science, true daughter of time you are, who who alterest all things with thy peering eyes. Why praisest thou thus upon the poet's heart? Why do you prey upon the poet's heart? Vulture whose wings are dull realities. So a sonnet usually is in praise of some, someone, but in this case, it's asking, why do you torture poets with your peering eyes, with, with your beak like that of a vulture? And then the next line is really the heart of the poem. How should he love thee? How deem thee wise? How should a poet love science? How deem thee wise? Who would not leave him in his wandering to seek for treasure in the jeweled skies? So it's asking of science, this new goddess, who's changing reality, who's chasing away all the ancient gods and goddesses, right? The Diana, who used to be the goddess of the moon. Instead of that, we now see this cratered satellite. Right? Instead, of, instead of the Hamadryads who populated the forest, now we just see timber, or we see what a botanist sees. We've, we don't see the world the way that people did who inhabited a world of myth and poetry, because of that, Poe's asking, well, how should a poet love you now that you've made everything a dull reality? And a lot of people have read this poem as really a standard romantic critique of science, right? In, this is the age of romanticism. Poe enters that, that movement late and with a, a very skeptical uh, uh, attitude, but he's very influenced by Coleridge, by Wordsworth, by Byron. These are all his heroes when he's young. And so people just assume 
the criticism that a lot of romantic poets give to science is one that Poe is following. Poetry doesn't have a place in a world, or it has to be somehow far outside of a world that's dominated by science and dominated by industry and technology. And that's the way it's usually read. But I read this poem in a rather different way, because the, starting with that first question, how should a poet love thee? How deem thee wise? The rest of the poem is a series of questions about how, how should you uh, approach or how should you address science if you are committed to poetry like Poe is, if you're created, committed to fiction and the imagination, without just setting it aside, without just ignoring it, without just attacking it, how can you love it? How can you understand its particular way of knowing the world, appreciate its form of knowledge, and at the same time, not be completely overwhelmed by it, not be completely destroyed or replaced by it? And I see that question, how should a poet love science? How should he deem it wise? Running throughout his entire life and everything he writes, he's, he's looking for new ways for the artist, for the poet, for the imaginative person to make sense of, to confront, to work with, or to make new kinds of combinations between imagination and fact, between poetry and, and science, between the, the, dr the dream and that which is real, the, and that which is experienced, between spirit and matter as well. So in, in his work over and over, there's a confrontation between these aspects of the world or these aspects of the mind that are usually seen as totally polarized, imagination and reason, spirit and matter. And he comes up in many, many creative new ways, inventing new genres, as you mentioned, the detective story, science fiction, horror, new ways of combining them, new ways of mixing them, new ways of setting them against each other, setting them in dialogue or bringing them into harmony. And every one of his works, I, I think, is, is answering that question in one way or another. In 2019, an international team, led in part by Heino Falke, took the first ever image of a black hole. Dr. Falke joined us to talk about his book, Light in the Darkness, Black Holes, the Universe, and Us. In this clip, he discussed how our knowledge of black holes has evolved and how the team came together across the globe to take that historic image. Until Martin Schmidt, the Dutchman and Caltech, realized this one particular radio source comes from something that looks like a star. So they call this a qua quasar, quasi-stellar radio source. And it turned out this star was billions of light years away. It couldn't be a star. No star can be seen on such a large distance. And that, that thing had to be as luminous as an entire galaxy, actually 30 times a galaxy, a thousand billion stars shining and all this light would come from a little tiny point what can produce so much light and so much energy and the idea that came up was that maybe it's a black hole maybe that's a black hole at the center of a galaxy where matter falls in and becomes heated up and starts to radiate and so that's why in the in the 60s 70s people started to think in earnest about black holes and there was some evidence there of stellar uh, black holes that, you know, some X-ray emission from, from certain stellar sources could also be black holes. Um, so the idea was around until, you know, the, the, the 90s. And then if you want to think about, you know, I want to see one of these things, it has to be big. You know, you need a big telescope to see them, and you need a big source. And I was working on... Um, on supermassive black holes. So these are, oh, these are the ones in the centers of galaxies where you know, many small black holes collapsed into a big one. And if you want to look at you know, which are the, on the sky, which one would appear the brightest, then it's essentially this big supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way. And it's this potential supermassive black hole candidate in the galaxy M87. Why M87? M87 is a monster galaxy. It's 55 million light years away. Uh, it's 2,000 times further away than, um, than our own center of the Milky Way. But it's, you know, the black hole mass that people estimated also in the middle of the 90s using the Hubble Space Telescope said this could be 6 billion times the mass of the sun concentrated in the center of the galaxy. In the center of our own Milky Way, we had a black hole maybe of 4 million times the mass of the sun. The bows are really massive. And they are the closest of the big heavy guys in our universe. So that's where you want to look. 
AMSI greatly appreciates our friends at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and we're proud to help tell their story. In this next clip, you'll hear part of our interview with the lab director, Dr. Thomas Zachariah, as he speaks about ORNL as the lab of the future. So the lab of the future is an interesting concept. It is, you know, it, so obviously, one, the reimagining was undertaken in order to make sure that we have the leadership and the organizational structure that allows us to pursue the sort of world-changing aspiration of organization, which, as I said, is in our DNA to have won the world war and, and change the world as in, based on a number of innovations and technologies that have come from this laboratory. But Lab of the Future also has a, a another important concept and an opportunity from my point of view, which is increasingly economic security uh, of our country in the in a globally connected world uh, is in my opinion national security mm -hmm. and and it's something that national laboratories are uniquely suited to support our nation and so if you just step back and look at where all the innovation jobs that have been created in in the last 10 to 15 years it's been majority of those innovation jobs have been created in around 40 counties in this country. Put that in perspective. It is, we have about over 3,000 counties in the United States, and only 40 counties participate in all those uh, job creation. Mm -hmm. And I think there is increasing recognition that we have to spread that opportunity. Now, you know, spreading those opportunities into the Midwest and Appalachian region, the, you know, the East Tennessee region, is, is hard unless you have some of the natural capabilities, ingredients that is necessary to do that. What are the ingredients? Well, we are blessed with the fact that we have a, uh, the state's land grant institution, the University of Tennessee, in, in our hometown. We also have Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a $10 billion public utility with economic development as a major mandate. And with, that, with Department of Energy, we get predictably you know, $4.5 billion to, to our number of facilities, DOE facilities here. But as you pointed out, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is, is the largest science laboratory in, in the nation. And we have unique facilities and people to build such an innovation ecosystem. So increasingly, as I think about the lab of the future, we have this dimension about driving science and innovation, but also being a, a an engaged participant in the community to drive an innovation ecosystem that can create more jobs and therefore improve the community that we live and work. We're grateful for our friends at the University of Tennessee, and one of those, Dr. Karen Lloyd, a microbiologist at UT Knoxville, joined me on AMSICAST to talk about her intriguing work with microbes in the Arctic. I sort of think of microbes as doing all the important chemical stuff behind the scenes. So they're making our oxygen, they recycle our waste, they make soil good for plants. They basically are keeping Earth in its current habitable state. Um, and of course, they a lot of problems too. Disease is the one that we know about the best. And obviously, even if you're not sick from COVID-19, you definitely are having some disruption to your life due to it. And some of them will contribute to greenhouse gases. So they can be either some of them might be helpful for um, mitigating climate change and others of them are cheering it along and making it worse. So they're really powerful behind the scenes actors in almost everything going on in Earth systems, so it's important to understand what they do. I'm a huge fan of the sci-fi writer Andy Weir, so I was thrilled when he agreed to join me on AMSICAST. The author of books such as The Martian and Project Hail Mary, Andy was a delight to speak with. In this clip, he tells us some of the secrets of writing science fiction. Basically, I, I need the reader to un understand enough of the science so that they can understand the plot and why this thing is hard and why that solution won't work and so on. But I've got to stop there. I, I, I try not to overwhelm the reader. Yeah. And also, one thing I've found that only it's a, it's a deep, deep, dark secret that only I and a million other authors know <laughs> is um, 
the reader will forgive you any amount of exposition if it's funny. Uh, if you make the reader laugh, they will not only uh, be happy to read, you know, expositional paragraphs, but they'll actually absorb the information pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I try to make the exposition funny or at least entertaining. Yeah. When I began serving as director of AMC, I was told by so many people that I needed to immediately read Denise Kiernan's book, The Girls of Atomic City. It's a great read, so I was very glad that Denise agreed to join me on AMCcast. In this clip, she talks about what motivated the amazing women who were so key to the success of the Manhattan Project. I didn't want women who all worked in the same facility or had the same job. I didn't want women who were all from the same town because you could easily do that when you start talking to people a lot of people came over in groups or with their with extended family um i wanted people if possible some married some single some living with their families some living in the dorms some living nearby i wanted to have as much of a variety as as possible and the common the common attribute i found with the women i ended up choosing was <laughs> There were a couple things. I mean, in addition to a real desire to, to do something for the war effort, it was this sense of adventure uh, in, a, in many ways. For that time, especially, you know, I, I have friends sending their kids off to college now, and these kids, you know, they have cell phones and they have computers and they have, you know, a million ways to be connected and um, everybody's still very nervous about them going three hours away for college. Well, a lot of these, these women had none of that and had no idea where they were going and said, yep, I'm going to do this. And these were, you know, a lot of them came, were coming right out of their parents' homes. So they were really kind of incredibly brave in a lot of ways. And I think that is definitely one of the, one of the commonalities that, that these women shared in addition to being extremely, um, you know, being very hardworking and having a, a, a sense of responsibility about what it was that they were doing, which is different than bragging about what you're doing. Uh, they, they, just, they just felt, uh, they took what they did uh, very seriously. It didn't matter if it was quote unquote, you know, what people would refer to as, you know, menial labor, which always sounds a little, you know, a little dismissive. Um, labor is labor and it should all be respected. And, and these women had that respect for themselves and the people who worked alongside them. So I think those were some of the things that, that these women had in common. My good friend, Alan Packwood, director of the Churchill Archive Center at Cambridge University, spoke with me on AMCCAST about Prime Minister Churchill's support of science during World War II, including the code-breaking work done at the famous Bletchley Park. Can you tell us how Churchill supported the work there and how the Prime Minister then used the invaluable intelligence he gathered from those folks? Um, well, of course, Churchill referred to the intelligence coming from um, Bletchley Park, where the German codes were being broken as the geese that laid the golden eggs but <laughs> never cackled. <laughs> um, and in 1941, when the code breakers at Bletchley appealed directly to him for further resources and further funding, he was very quick to respond, ordering that they should be given everything they needed. Um, after all, Bletchley Park had grown out of the Admiralty's own World War I code-breaking operation, Room 40, which Churchill had presided over in 1914. So he was a long-standing supporter and proponent um, of intelligence, and he loved intelligence. As World War II Prime Minister, he insisted on seeing the raw decrypts on a near-daily basis, and he ref regularly referred to, to most secret information or bond face information, um, as it was codenamed, in his telegrams to his commanders in the field. Arguably, he was sometimes over-reliant on it, but um, it certainly um, gave him an edge. Now, he knew it was vital to defeat Hitler by whatever means necessary, including what he called ungentlemanly warfare. What did that warfare entail, and how did it use or inspire technological innovations? Mm. Well, Churchill knew that war was in some ways a scientific race and one that the Allies had to win. 
I don't think he ever shied away from what we would perhaps now call weapons of mass destruction, um, because there was a risk that if we didn't develop them, then the enemy would and would acquire them first and use them against us. So he was ready to use poison gas if it was used against Britain or her allies. And of course, he didn't flinch from developing the atomic bomb. Dr. Michelle Thaller, Assistant Director of Science for Communications at NASA, is a great friend of AMSI. She took part in AMSI Eureka, a series of interviews that will be available to 117 Society members, focusing on the role of inspiration, intuition, and Eureka moments in science. Michelle also was a guest on AMSICast. In this clip, she talks about the nature of the Big Bang and the incredibly fundamental importance of light in our universe. I'm wondering if there is more than one universe, this idea that, mm -hmm. you know, what, what we think of as the universe could be part of something even bigger called the multiverse. Right. We don't have any evidence of that yet, but that's something that we're working on. Mm -hmm. there, there, there was an idea that was very popular about 50 years ago that eventually the universe would, would, would slow down and stop expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the gravity between the galaxies. And, and then you had the addition of all the extra matter, dark matter, which has gravity. Yeah. Uh, they figured, well, hey, maybe all the galaxies will slow down eventually. And then things will start reversing. And, and maybe everything will start crashing back together again. And maybe we'll end up in that hot, dense state again. And maybe that sets off another Big Bang. And, you know, this is called the, uh, the oscillating universe. The, the unfortunate thing <laughs> is that um, about, about 10 years ago, uh, we made a, a very good measurement. Three different teams did. In fact, two of my friends from grad school got the Nobel Prize. It's always, mm. kind of makes you feel like you're not doing anything with your life. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a... Uh, they, they actually measured how, how much the universe was, was slowing down, and they got the opposite result, mm -hmm. that the universe is speeding up faster and faster all the time. As far as we can measure it right now, and, I mean, things may change as we get better understandings in the future. Um, as far as we can measure it now, the universe really will, will not only expand forever, but it will expand faster and faster and faster all the time. And uh, that does not bode well <laughs> coming <laughs> right. back together. Yeah. But, but, but there's an idea that, in fact, maybe uh, maybe the Big Bang never stopped. It just keeps going on in different dimensions, in different directions. Oh, and, you know, our universe is one bubble of a mm. froth of bubbles that are constantly being pushed off from the, you know, the hyperspace, you know, the, 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 the dimensional space we're not really aware of. So uh, that's conjecture. You know, mm. we, we know that our observable universe is, is expanding and actually getting faster all the time. Mm. So uh, another thing that is amazing to think about and kind of hard to wrap your arms around is light and the speed of light. And I know I watched a terrific video of you talking about that, and you state in that that light does not experience space or time. So can you tell us what that meant and why the speed of light is so fundamental in understanding the universe? Oh, boy. You know, this is one of these things that you, know, you wish you had a whole afternoon to talk to people about. <laughs> right. um, it's... Um, you know, we can do multiple episodes, Michelle. Uh, <laughs> for one thing, okay, for one thing, it was one of those results nobody was looking for. Mm -hmm. So if you go back uh, into the late 1800s, um, people were devising better and better ways to measure the speed of light. Um, I mean, even Galileo, 400 years ago, tried to measure the speed of light by uh, opening lanterns on, on, on distant hills and trying to, uh, to perceive a time difference. But what he didn't realize, light is so fast. Uh, you know, 186,000 miles per second, as we said, that um, there just wasn't any way for him at that time to detect it. But in the late 1800s, they were beginning to get good enough at detecting the speed of light. And and so they decided to do a grand experiment, actually in California, at Mount Wilson, where you know the Earth goes around the sun really quickly. I mean, we're, we're actually orbiting the sun at about 67,000 miles an hour. And so the idea is, you know, with our very, very uh, sensitive equipment, we're going to measure the speed of light in the direction the Earth is going, you know, around the sun, and then in the direction away from the Earth, where the Earth is going. And there should be a difference of, you know, more than 120,000 you know, miles, because in, in one direction, we're going with the sun, with, with the Earth's rotation. So basically, we're adding that, you know, 67,000 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, it's, so we're almost sort of catching up to the light that we shine in that direction. If we shine a light in that direction, we're already going with it, 67,000 miles an hour. And then in the opposite direction, you know, we, we shine light away, and now we're racing away from it at 67,000 miles an hour. So, you know, we should be able to detect the difference in the speed of light. And they, they did this over and over again, better and better sensitivity. And, and I mean, the, 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 the darn result is that light always travels at the same speed hmm. to an observer. You cannot see it traveling anything other than the speed of light. 
This is, this is that classic question. If you were going 90% speed of light and you shown a flashlight ahead of you and you shown a flashlight behind you, hmm. how fast would you measure the light coming out of those flashlights? And this was an amazing discovery that nobody expected. And it, it just blew all of our physics apart at the time. Because the answer is, you will always see the speed of light going exactly at the speed of light. John Riggs, author of High Tension, FDR's Battle to Power America, spoke with us about a topic near and dear to us here in Tennessee. President Roosevelt, the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the TVA's huge impact, not just on the availability of energy, but on economic development as well. I would say the winner was the American people. Uh, it wasn't a, a total victory by either side. Um, but the people benefited because rates were reduced dramatically, electricity rates. Roosevelt had said he wanted these federal dams to provide a yardstick against which you could measure private rates. And for that reason, or the additional cheap hydropower, rates came down fairly dramatically uh, during the 1930s. And they had, been, they had risen pretty dramatically in the 1920s when the holding companies were pretty much in charge. And the public-private utility system that resulted and that exists to this day fueled our country's dramatic economic growth for the rest of the century. Public power grew dramatically with the building of the federal dams. It went from 6% of utility generation in 1932 to, I think, 19% at the end of the war. But private power grew as well and, and still remains by far the larger power producer. Um, Roosevelt succeeded in destroying the holding companies, so he won that battle. But the, an economic historian, Harold Underwood Faulkner, said no company died that seemed to have the slightest reason for living. Oh. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was a victory, but maybe it wasn't as hard as it seemed at the time. And the other thing that the private industry didn't lose on, the, the operating companies at the base, the ones that served people directly, weren't restructured. In fact, they may have come out ahead by not having to send all their profits up the ladder of that uh, holding company pyramid. And Roosevelt did not want to destroy them. He said in a speech during his 1929 campaign, I think, that um, if, a, if a, the citizens of a town don't want their utility, they should be able to form their own, but the normal model should be a privately owned electric utility. And we still had that at the end of the Roosevelt administration. The creation of TEA was a, was a Roosevelt victory. And Henry Steele Commager, another historian, called that at some point probably the greatest peacetime achievement of 20th century America. Overstatement, I don't know, but it, but it, it was a significant achievement and that was a clear victory for Roosevelt and the administration. Cynthia Barnett, author of the book Rain, spoke with us about Rain's role in our climate, our history, our culture, and in our day-to-day -day lives. In this clip, she talks about rain and the relatively recent phenomenon of weather forecasting. In Victorian times, the, the, the people in England were very skeptical of weather forecasting, and they saw it like some kind of a voodoo, and they were really unhappy about it. And Americans just loved it. We absolutely loved weather forecasting from the time of Thomas Jefferson, who in this book I refer to as our founding forecaster. And he just loved, he loved measuring rain and would measure rain everywhere he went. Even when he would visit Paris, he would bring, he would bring his uh, weather instrumentation and write all the details down in his little weather memorandum book, which you can still see in the Library of Commerce. Uh, a Library of Congress, and they're they're really neat to look at. But here, uh, it was really the telegraph in the United States that made scientific forecasting tangible for for Americans. So then and now, the best way to know how the weather is going to behave wherever you are is to ask its most recent host, right? So in in 1847, three years after. Uh, Morse electrically transmitted his famous message, what hath God wrought from Washington to Baltimore over the telegraph? 
America's first government meteorologist, James Pollard Espy, who was, his nickname was the Storm King. And he pitched, he pitched the idea of a national weather network connected by telegraph lines. And he sold this idea to Joseph Henry, who was the director of the brand new Smithsonian Institution. And he convinced his board that telegraphing weather from the far west of the United States to the southern reaches of the country would, and I'll, I'll quote him here, furnish a ready means of warning the more northern and eastern observers to be on the watch for the first appearance of an advancing storm. So by 1860, there were 500 stations across the United States telegraphing their weather reports to Washington. 